Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're ready to uh, start our uh, artist talk for this evening. I'm joined by the art faculty and their art, uh, which is currently on display at the Gretzky Gallery on the campus of the College of St. Benedict. That's located in the Benedict and Benedicta Art Center, the Gretzky Gallery. I'm Jill W. Kuhn, Gallery Manager for Fine Arts Programming at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. And as you can see, the art faculty show that you are viewing right now uh, contains a diverse array of work in painting, photography, video, book arts, ceramics, and sculpture. This much anticipated exhibition occurs every two to three years at alternating campus gallery locations. I have had the opportunity to install five faculty shows during my time here. And I'm continually amazed at how without having any kind of conversation or previous planning with each other, there's a common thread that often occurs in the art that's submitted. This was the year of multiples and grids as smaller parts added up to make the complete statement. I want to especially um, thank my gallery assistants for their dedications and uh, dedication and skills in hanging this show. Here's the schedule of events for tonight's talk. Each artist will introduce themselves, show examples of his or her work in the show and talk briefly about it. Carol Brass, our professor of art history, will then ask faculty a series of questions. Viewers are encouraged to type in questions too. Before we begin, I would like to remind students who are attending this virtual artist talk to fulfill part of their FAE, our fine arts experience requirement to follow these instructions. During the talk, a code will appear on the screen for five minutes. At that time, please click the link in the video description below and fill out the form that comes up. You have five minutes of the code being displayed to receive credit. If you do have any questions or concerns, please email fae at csbsju.edu. Okay, are we ready everyone? Carol, can you start us off please? Thank you, Jill, for that wonderful introduction. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Carol Brash and I am an associate professor of art history and Asian studies here at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. And I am thrilled to be here to share the work of my colleagues who've pivoted and continue to create in these unexpected times. I'm an art historian, so I don't have art in the show. Rather, I study art as a way to process and interrogate and reveal truths as we will see tonight. Since um, our last faculty exhibition, I have continued ongoing research on Chinese gardens, although the pandemic prevented me from traveling. And just before the lockdown, I was able to attend a symposium returning hours before that lockdown. And this led me to revisiting some of my translations of poems written about a 16th century garden in China. So I pivoted too. <laughs> Any scholarly presentations are now virtual. And my most recent one was given for a class at the University of Kansas back in October and was titled, as you see before you, um, Chinese Gardens in America cultivating the present past. Um, and among my presentations since our last exhibition, um, another occurred when I was invited to give a talk at the Huntington Library Center for the East Asian Gardens for East Asian Garden Studies entitled Representations of the Garden of Solitary Delight, the Du Lu Yuan. 
Um, you can hear me put all of these seemingly disparate things together in a broad overview of Chinese gardens on May 10th at 5 p.m. And that will be called Chinese Gardens as Sites for Sighting, Sighting, and Insighting. You need to see the spellings to fully understand that. <laughs> um, and in addition, um, I am honored to introduce the work of Sister Dennis Frandrup, uh, OSB, who is unable to join us today. Um, Sister Dennis arrived at the monastery in 1946 and then graduated from St. Ben's High School in 1950. And after um, uh, joining um, the monastery and teaching, um, starting in 1973, um, she continued teaching full time until 2005, at which point she remained as our artist and residence at the College of St. Benedict and earned the title of Professor of Art Emerita. Um, and up until the start of the pandemic, she could be seen biking on campus and um, worked every day in her studio at the BAC. And uh, we look forward to seeing her there again soon, where she can continue her experiments and refinements with clay and glaze. On screen, we have an example of some of her most recent work. And as she notes in her artist statement, uh, quote, the glaze on these three pieces is one that's challenged me for years. And I still do not have a grasp of these glazes behavior. There's been little consistency in the firings. The glaze can vary from surprisingly beautiful to absolutely horrendous. One learns to take what the kiln offers. Will I continue to use this glaze? Absolutely. Surprises are always welcome." End quote. Artists like Sister Frandra and my colleagues that you'll be hearing from shortly challenge us to be brave in our creativity and gentle and forgiving with ourselves when things don't go exactly as planned. The gentle and yet confident contours of these three jars each carry the modeled glaze slightly differently demonstrating the variations of the glaze and the promise and beauty in each distinctly dappled surface. I now have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, Mary Johnson, who will talk about her fascinating work and processes. Thank you for the introduction, Carol. Um, I am delighted to be a part of this beautiful show, and I hope you'll all go get to see it in person. Um, again, I'm Mary Johnson. I teach sculpture, and the image you're looking at is my work in the show titled Here Away, which I made in 2020. Um, I tend to work in series, so there are a few other sculptures that I have that are related to this one in um, materials and thought processes. Um, I had set out to create a new body of work in 2020 and really um, push my experimentation with materials. Um, but this took on a whole new meaning with the pandemic and the lockdown and the eventual closing of stores. So I had um, not much ability to go out and find these materials that I had hoped to use. Um, so what I did was look closely at the scraps um, that I had in my studio already that I wasn't actually planning on using. Um, things like uh, this styrofoam, this packing styrofoam, and other things that friends had given me. Like, for example, I had a bag of sequins from a friend. Um, so the other thing I did was return to my roots of drawing and painting, and I started adding a lot of paint. Um, and so these works land somewhere between uh, painting and sculpture. Um, and here away, what you're looking at is one of these. Um, all of the materials are salvaged or repurposed. Um, 
you'll see there's several plastics on there. There's styrofoam and there's some synthetic fabric that wraps some of that styrofoam. And there's some of those sequins that I mentioned in there too. And they are meant to draw um, the viewer's attention to environmental issues and uh, serve as a reminder of these day in and day out materials that we run across or use um, that are, you know, they're basically never going away um, in a landfill or wherever they uh, may end up. Um, the painting came about when I moved the, um, the styrofoam off this protective plastic sheet that I had on my studio floor and I kind of slid it off. And then this perfect uh, landscape was revealed. And finally, the wood at the bottom uh, is a piece of cedar um, that was from a friend uh, who had been cleaning out her garage and she gave me several um, really beautiful pieces of wood. Um, but I was really drawn to this one because of its figurative form and um, also cedar symbolizes endurance, which I thought was very, very fitting for this piece. Um, so to just kind of wrap it up, um, my experimental process ended up taking a very sharp turn. And so I just really embraced it and went for it. And everything really um, came together at once um, through the actual making of the work, but also through taking this extra time that I had and really looking at um, the materials and listening to these conversations as this eclectic grouping of materials I had were juxtaposed in my studio. Um, and I'm still working on some of these cross-disciplinary um, sculptures and I hope to complete the body of work in the next couple of months. Um, so thank you for your time and attention. And with that, I am pleased to introduce the next panelist, Sam Johnson. Hi, everybody. Um, so my, my name is Sam Johnson, and I teach um, ceramics and um, uh, a senior capstone course called uh, a Senior Studio Thesis. And um, most of my career has been focused on making pottery, um, although I have a background in uh, painting as well. And uh, for this exhibition, I have three uh, pieces in the show. Uh, the piece you see here is a, um, a long, narrow uh, oil painting uh, called uh, Slough Off the Dead. And I have a ceramic uh, spear, which is like a, a vase, and then another uh, black oil uh, painting. The um, themes that I'm, I'm really thinking about in both the painting and the ceramics that I work on yeah, are related to um, kind of relationships between order and disorder or aspects of structure and elements of uh, structure sometimes that are at odds with that, that um, those areas of structure. So if you uh, look at the um, uh, oil stick paintings from a, a distance, they may seem uh, black and maybe without much um, surface activity. Um, they may seem like um, uh, kind of like certain geometric forms. Um, but as you approach them, oftentimes other things within the painting itself reveals itself through texture, through light and shadow, um, or through the physical presence of the overall composition. And with the, uh, you know, kind of with the uh, isolation that came along with COVID, um, my, my work took, took a turn as well. Um, and I think that I started becoming interested in working on things that felt contemplative to me, which is why I started to make uh, these spherical bases, as well as uh, working on uh, highly structured uh, paintings. Um, I wanted something that felt calm or, or certain at, in one sense, and then um, disordered or um, 
somehow at odds or full of tension when one looked at them a little bit more clearly. Um, so uh, with that, I think I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Rachel Mellis. Um, and um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Sam and viewers for being here. As some of you may know, I recently had the opportunity to show a whole series of paintings in this same gallery. My 37 gouache paintings featured the fruits and vegetables often used as metaphors for pregnancy, specifically as stand-ins for the sizes of human embryos and fetuses at developmental stages. In the midst of that five-year painting project, I was invited by curator Amy Tullius to participate in a traveling public artwork called Train Tracks, T-R-A-C-T-S. 12 authors, including our own English professor, Rachel Marston, wrote texts inspired by the theme of travel and strangers. 12 artists each created a book with texts from one of the authors. And then we gave 12 copies of each book to strangers at train stations who were told that the book was theirs to read on their journey comment on, and after a week, mail to a gallery in Salt Lake City for an exhibition. This, I should say, was in the early winter of 2019. Now, you may or may not know um, that many letterpress printers are closet or not so closet fans of train travel. It goes with our overall steampunk person personalities. Suffice it to say, I was thrilled with the concept of the project, especially once I read the text chosen for me, a short essay titled Of Pregnancy, Strangers, and Pilgrimage by then pregnant author, Emily Dyer Barker. Barker's text, inspired by a Sylvia Plath poem that likens pregnancy to rising bread, melons, and trains, expands, uh, so Barker uh, then expanded Plath's train metaphor to describe the fetus as a passenger on an unpredictable ride. We mothers never really know exactly when or where or how safely our babies will disembark. With a text so full of imagery, I chose to add only a repeated circle motif. So you can see it here on the, on the inside of the book, there's a little kind of circle globe and on the outside of the jacket and the outside of the book itself, this little circle. That was my only imagery, uh, despite the temptation to produce more seed pods like in my painting show. Mostly I focused on materials and binding. I created a multi-piece organic and organ-like girdle book. A girdle book is a medieval book uh, binding or structure uh, intended to allow you to, to keep a book kind of uh, attached on a chain uh, to, to a chain or a girdle or, or belt around your waist. It's meant basically to be worn on a journey. The horizontal concertina, concertina or accordion structure I used includes two vertical concertinas that unfurl like two maps or train tracks. In this image, you can see a longer one on the left with a circle at the bottom and a shorter one on the right. There, uh, the left hand one contains the book's text and the one on the right contains the book's instructions. My instructions asked readers to complete my book by untying the leather cord in its middle, removing the book from uh, it's a leather covering and then sealing the book inside its cloth book jacket, which you can see on the left. Uh, it's red, little red envelope with a large uh, paper sticker on top, circle sticker. And then they could use the sticker to seal the book inside its cloth book jacket and mail it. Uh, the leather and cord could be kept, repurposed or given away. A decision mothers, midwives and doctors have always had to make about placentas. Only a couple of the copies of my book made it to Salt Lake City. I don't know where the others ended up or how safely. Fortunately, I made a few extra to sell at MCBA in Minneapolis, the Abecedarian Gallery in Colorado, and here. I stamped them all as if ready to go to their final destination, which as with all books and beings can never really be known. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Scott Murphy. Howdy everybody, um, <clears throat> and happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, so yes, uh, 
I am indeed Scott Murphy and I teach photography 2D, 4D and paper making. Um, and uh, what I've got here for you today is a giant Zeppelin uh, shaped um, aircraft. Um, so I am a book artist and photographer and what that typically means is that I work with photographs in analog, experimental and digital ways um, and usually make some sort of book form that is hand holdable and um, interactive. But at the same time, I like the idea of trying to make things that are large and create a different kind of experience for the viewer. And a few years ago, I'd made a very large image out of smaller pieces. And that made me think about that as a possible way of moving forward with small things to large things in terms of experiences of art. And so um, I've always had a desire to make something about uh, airships. And this is tied to me growing up and the fact that my father was very interested in airships and saw the Hindenburg on its uh, voyage to its doom. Um, and so um, it's always been kind of in my mind. And so I've been gathering materials over the years. And I found this postcard last year that has this uh, Schutte Lance airship, the SL-1, um, that was sent in 1918 and has um, a, um, it was used, it has um, text in German on the back. And I really quite found it fascinating. And so I decided I would work with that. Um, and I teach digital collage all the time, but I rarely actually do it myself. So I decided I would just kind of play with the notion of digital collage. And so I took the front and the back of this um, postcard and combined them into one um, and had some fun with, with color and um, kind of just creating something I thought was visually interesting from all the parts. Um, and at the same time, while I was making this large composite image, it is indeed, uh, I was thinking of it as an unbound book so that it would be small pieces that you could hold and, and flip through. And so I had to figure out, well, what would the other part of it be? What would the back be? Um, and so I found this obscure article about this obscure aircraft manufacturer, Schutte Lanz, and I really quite liked it. Um, so I decided to use that as the text on the back. And it had eight pictures of their airships that were all terrible, terrible quality. Um, so I scanned them and decided to just go with the terrible quality and make the halftone pattern that was present part of the piece. And so on the back is the story of Schutte Lanz, the, uh, the airship maker. Um, and excerpts of all the little pieces of those photographs. So um, <clears throat> if we didn't have COVID times, we would have one that you could go through by hand and kind of read, read it like you would read a book. But as we don't have that as <laughs> a real uh, um, way of um, sharing artwork, they're all pinned up on the wall as well in the order that you would read them. Um, so yeah, there you go. Um, so this was all found imagery and found text. And the other piece I have in the show is um, for the Artemat, which are recycled, uh, recycled cigarette uh, vending machines that dispense cigarette sized art. And uh, I have a series of pinhole photographs, Pan America, which is just basically, I like going on road trips every year or two. And I take uh, pinhole photographs with a wooden pinhole camera of places I think are interesting. And then I put them on these little blocks. And if you find a vending machine that has my art in it, you can get a nice little block for $5. It's a nice democratic uh, sharing of art that's accessible all over the world. Um, and if you're interested more about that, you can actually go to the Artemat site and take a look at it. So that's kind of a quick overview of the things that I have in the show and the kind of stuff that I make. Uh, and so I have the privilege then of introducing our next speaker. Um, and so here we go, passing it over to Elaine Rutherford. All right, hello. Um, thank you, Scott. Uh, I'm Elaine Rutherford. I teach drawing and painting and a variety of other things at St. Ben's and St. John's. Um, so uh, what I think I'm going to talk about now are um, being lost and the things that we do to find our way when we feel a bit lost. The piece that is on the screen right now is from a series of many small blue dots called Things That I See When I Breathe. These are um, from a daily, these are uh, illustrations, these are representations of the things that I see 
at the end of my daily breathing practice, which I will be happy to tell you all more about later, if anyone's interested. Um, I think that when we feel a bit lost, either in general, in life, or in our art making practice, at least for me, the two things that are most important are one, to keep breathing, and two, to keep making. Um, so for a couple of years now, a few years, I have been engaged in a daily breathing practice whereby I begin my day um, in this way. And the blue dots are representations of what I see on the hold in the interior space in, this, in, in my mind's eye, sort of a blue glow. Um, and I think that they are, so they're the visual phenomenon that uh, is the moment that I think that I enter the sort of uh, psychological space and they operate like beacons or navigational guides much like um, the map lines that are in the other piece that I have in the show. The piece that's on the screen right now is part of a series. The, there's one piece in the show that is uh, part of this series, We Are All Explorers. Um, there are three of these, it's a triptych. This is one, um, and the next one has sewn map lines on it. Um, and these map lines, I think, also operate as navigational tools to find our way through um, some kind of atmospheric space or experience that um, captures our uh, search for meaning. All right. Well, on that uh, on that note, I am going to hand things over to my good friend and colleague, Andrea Shaker. Thank you. So, uh, well, thank you, Elaine. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, in, a, in a broad sense, about the work that I have in the show um, and, you know, how the process for creating this work um, really informs the, the work itself. Um, I have in the show five um, platinum palladium prints, and they are from a body of work entitled On Bait. Um, On Bait is comprised of uh, still and moving image, um, as well as uh, written word um, and experimental film. Um, I made all the, the video and, and still imagery um, during a sabbatical um, in 2017, um, during the spring and and or the winter and spring of 2017, that I spent um, that I spent in Lebanon, and uh, the many of the the images um, or all of the images were made in various locations um, uh, in Lebanon, um, but many of them were made in my ancestral village um, and even specifically in um, my ancestral home in the the Shouf Mountains. Um, uh, a little bit about Beit. Um, Beit in Arabic um, translates as, as house or home, um, but the, the meaning in Arabic is, is more nuanced or, or layered than, um, than in English. And uh, as the curator of this exhibition on Beit, which um, closed, uh, uh, the, the full exhibition closed in St. Paul, like shortly before um, the pandemic and everything closed down in um, in early 2020, um, but the, the curator um, is talking a bit about in her curatorial statement about, um, about what bait means. Um, and she continues on to say that um, Michelle Baroudi, that she says, um, the home real and imagined shapes our memories and our bodies. The bait is imprinted on our limbs and infused in our every being. And this really relates a lot to to what I'm thinking about in terms of home um, and the work and memory and a sense of of imagination, um, uh, both of memory and of the possibility um, for uh, uh, for our futures. So, with this work, I'm I'm really thinking about how glimpses of memories that you know are like the photograph and and through the photograph um, really recall and frag 
fragments uh, and forget fragments of, of um, memories around Beit, um, around this home, whether they're real, imagined, um, or inherited. And it's especially, um, I'm especially really compelled by, by how the photograph um, simultaneously remembers and forgets um, and will only ever tell part of the story. So through this, this work, I have um, examined how these memories, experiences, um, uh, ones that are maybe historical, familiar, um, are at times, you know, in, in ways that we may know, but also in, in ways that we might not know how these, these memories become transferred across and through generations, and then they become imprinted on and in our bodies, um, and they inform our relationship to bait. Um, and uh, as Michelle writes about our everyday movements, um, and that they also really imagine our sense of um, a future you know, and, and, and how, um, how we move through and how we imagine our sense of future. Um, with this work um, as, um, as well, I uh, think one of the things that was just really uh, important in the process were um, elements of collaboration. And I collaborated with, with several people. Um, I collaborated with dancers uh, Leila Awadallah and Sophia Musa, um, curator Michelle Baruti, Platinum Palladium, Palladium printer Keith Taylor and graphic designer um, Paula Curran. And, and I think one of the things that I'd like to, to say in this talk and knowing that there are, are um, you know, many, uh, hopefully many students um, who, are, who are listening to this, but it's, you know, it's, it was in all these layers of collaboration that I think really made Unbait um, more nuanced and rich. Um, really kind of brought together um, a lot of, of various threads um, uh, for me. But, you know, perhaps equally significantly for me, um, it was these collaborations that uh, really deepened and challenged my creative process. And I really um, want to kind of stress that um, for, the, for, for all of us, but I, I feel as though my work um, and my process and my practice are, are just really better for the um because of these collaborations with um with other artists so um with that um thank you um for um for being here today and for listening and i would um like to uh introduce um my colleague joe singwald thanks andrea um, my name is Joe Singwald, and I'm the tech for the art department, and I'm pleased to be part of this exhibition. This, this piece here um, really started with being gifted this vintage egg basket. A friend of mine was moving out of state, and it was kind of a deal where if you don't take the stuff that's not packed away, it's going to... Um, to a thrift store. So I grabbed a bunch of it, not really knowing what to do, but just to kind of save it. And there's just something about this basket that I was drawn to and um, decided that this faculty exhibition would be kind of the perfect opportunity to incorporate it in a piece, being that it, um, it's kind of an open-ended exhibition. We can bring whatever we feel um, really strongly about. Um, so, so that the basket started everything, but um, I and I think back to past shows I've had, and I kind of like this idea of pieces being hidden from view or partially hidden from view. You know, typically I, in an exhibition, I'll put everything on a pedestal or a vase or a, a a shelf on the wall, and you know, you try to have the best angle, the best lighting. But there's just something about not seeing everything. So I decided to make these whiskey cups and stack them, stack them inside this basket. Um, while I was making these, it was, we were almost a year into the pandemic and but it became clear that uh, vaccines were on the horizon. Uh, there was this hope that life was gonna hopefully <laughs> return to, um, to normal or that, or not normal, but to what we really were hoping for or wanting. Um, and um, I thought, 
all right. Um, uh, what would I want um, um, when it was safe to be around my friends and family? And ultimately, it's like, you know what I'd want is to invite uh, friends, family to a park, have a party where we could laugh, hug, celebrate each other's company. And um, so I titled this piece 2021 Picnic Basket. Um, with that in mind. So it's got 46 whiskey cups in it, um, not 45. I don't really like that number anymore. So 46 seemed a little bit more promising, more hopeful. Um, and yeah, students, anybody that's on campus, I encourage you to go see the exhibition. It's way different to walk through the space opposed to seeing it on the screen. So um, with that, uh, up next is Brother Simon Wafan. Thank you. One more. Thank you, Joe. My name is Simon Hua Fan. I'm a monk of St. John. Um, I teach classes in video, animation, and uh, documentary film production. Um, my piece is called uh, COVID, Cloister, and Cat. Uh, consists of uh, uh, six motion photographs. It was constructed with um, digital photo, video, and animation. Uh, and each image uh, in this series depicts on how a monk is affected by the uh, pandemic, uh, which may not be much different from the general population when it comes dealing with COVID. So this first image, um, Brother Felix is communicating with his family by phone. Uh, he is turned away from the natural source of light seen through the window on the right. Uh, the sunlight reveals the only thing that moves in this image, the tree branches dancing in the wind. Uh, here light is contrasted with shadow, movement with stagnation, absence with presence, and actuality with virtuality. Um, we all know how it feels to have a piece of cloth tightly pressed against our face whenever we go out to the public, right? And to have dry, chapped hands uh, from constant washing and, and sterilizing. Uh, here I turn these practices into rituals uh, as if they are performed faithfully in church. Uh, in this image, Brother Jeremy sits at the dining table turn away from his meal with his hands covering his nose and mouth. Uh, the coffee is churning in his cup and the wall behind him is dripping with water. Jeremy actually caught COVID-19 and it affected his taste and smell. Uh, the restless agitation, ag agitating of the coffee is contrasted with the still figure in isolation and the peace lily in the lower right corner uh, is there to balance the composition visually and symbolically. This is the kiss of peace performed to a barrier that's supposed to protect us from the deadly virus. Uh, just a little bit better than connecting with phone and computer screen. Uh, the only moving portion of this image is the edge of the plastic sheet at the bottom of the image, uh, showing how fragile and how tattered our relationship can be. People complain about feeling like a prisoner in their own home during the pandemic. Uh, looking through the window provides the space to yearn, to escape, and to imagine. Uh, Brother Lucian was actually thinking about the beach when I took this picture about a month ago. 
uh, during the bitter cold spell. And finally, the cat shows up in the last image um, and becomes the source of distraction from daily tasks. Uh, I adopted this little kitten uh, to cope with stress and uh, isolation. Um, the, the lack of concentration has been the problem for me, and I find it difficult to focus on the present or to try to take my mind off my worries and anxiety. Uh, here, the monk's attention is drawn away from prayer and study. And the cat is the source of his distraction, and the birds, in turn, distract the cat. There is also a, a spider, but not in this image, but elsewhere in this series. So we invite you to visit the gallery and take, in, uh, take time to explore and discover things in the artworks or the artworks that, that are displayed there. Uh, one last note, the monks in these images are from different parts of the country and of the world, including uh, Tanzania, China, Mexico, Iowa, and even St. Cloud. Uh, so no matter who you are, where you live, where you work or study or pray, and whatever your hopes and dreams are, it's a comfort to know that we share the struggles with humanity in this pandemic. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm looking at trying to get the question. Okay, question Q&A answer section thing open. So if any of you out in the world have some questions, um, Jill, can you let me know about time? Because <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll lose track. Um, but uh, if, if go ahead and type in questions. Otherwise, I, I have some sort of broad questions and some of them you have already addressed in your talks today. So, but but I might ask you to hit on them ag again. And just as you were talking, I, I came up with some new ones. So um, forgive me if they're not uh, exactly as I, I had indicated earlier. Um, many of you discussed the challenges of making art during a pandemic, right? And, and each of you, sort of um, dealt with that in a in a different way. Um, I'm wondering, what did you learn from that needing to pivot? Is there some practice or um, that you might take with you from this experience, assuming that it's all going to be over soon? <laughs> Um, well, I, for one, am going to embrace slowing down a bit in my studio. I enjoyed not having to rush for deadlines, and um, I feel like I, I was more thoughtful um, as a found object artist in thinking about what I was doing with these things. And so, yeah, I think I'm going to slow down more. Continue that, hopefully. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt early on that it was hard to concentrate. I, I lost um, the ability to focus, it felt, especially in the early weeks of um, the uh, isolation that I think we were we were experiencing um, about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And especially when I go to the grocery store or something and you just see the run on the grocery store items or I hear news reports of, of like... Um, growing unrest or, you know, I remember specifically hearing about like shortages on bullets, you know, and, and I just didn't know what was becoming. And um, I think throughout the, um, this past year, we've seen a lot of unmooring of uh, 
certain elements in our society that seemed grounded. Um, you know, everything from like, uh, well, things like facts or our understanding of uh, news or, um, you know, what's up, what's down. And, um, and it felt like we were really present to this idea that things that we rely on could change quickly, abruptly. Um, and I, so I thought a lot about that um, in my studio practice. And part of, part of what I found myself doing is going to the studio and uh, the work uh, itself calmed me um, down. I, I was able to focus. Um, the type of work I did started to change because of that. And I also selected some types of working, like working methods that were um, focusing um, like, especially like in ceramics, I started hand building more because I knew I could work on something for a little while and then leave it, um, and come back to it later. If I felt like it was too much to, to work on at any one time. And, um, so I think in, in a lot of ways that practice or that, that year's experience, uh, changed the way that I, I worked and I'll probably continue you know, thinking about those things. I know that's, I feel like there was a big change in my work because of the experiences of the year. And I'm sure that that will continue. It feels like growth to me. It feels like something new has started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll sort of follow up on that. I know that uh, Jill had mentioned at the beginning, you know, this sort of patterns, because you guys always do this, right? We work together and we have these overlapping um, um, conversations. And, and, uh, and then, of course, there's just sort of the group mind that we form, right? <laughs> um, but I was noticing, so Sam, you talked a bit about, about this and this seeking order out of chaos. And I think Elaine, some of your work also um, talked about sort of processing through the the chaos and trying to come to balance or order. Um, but I'm, I'm, um, so I, I'm wondering um, also about some of the forms that you chose, right? Both Sam, Elaine, and maybe Scott with the grids and, and some of the, um, very ordered forms that were chosen. And was that a part of a conscious thought process with, with your reactions to this? Um, I can uh, take a stab at the <laughs> um, So, well, so I think that, you know, the, the ex of, this exhibition in particular was felt different for me than other shows in that for whatever reason I felt able to use it more as an opportunity to um, give some more experimental work and processes an outing. I didn't feel like it needed to necessarily show my like you know the creme de la creme or anything. I felt like it was very much about um, process. And so the grid pieces um, actually are, so there are many more than are represented, the little blue dots, many more than mm -hmm. are represented mm -hmm. in the exhibition. And actually, as I'm sort of talking about process and thinking about that process, one of the things that I came to after having framed them and seen them installed is that I wish I would have not framed them. I would, because they're very ephemeral objects and they're about a very ephemeral thing, which is breath and breathing. Mm -hmm. Something that um, is, I mean, it is the, the, the source of life, you know, um, it is where we begin and end. And, um, and it's something that is, yeah, we're conscious of, we're not conscious of, it's gone as soon as it's begun. And so um, looking back, I regret capturing them behind glass in the way that I did. I feel that that actually runs counter to the spirit of the pieces. So if I could go back, I would change that. Um, 
I don't remember what else you asked, so I'll just uh, stop talking. Yeah. Well, you know, I could say something that's uh, related to what you're talking about, which is, um, so the grid was kind of be a part of the composite the way I was thinking about it. But um, what this turned into was also like uh, putting instructions into the actual design of the book so that um, I wouldn't have to be there. Right. Talk about like it, the the notion of sending it to a gallery and the instructions are built in, um, and then it's the responsibility of the curator to interpret those instructions and put it on the wall. Um, so it's collaborative in an extended sense in the way that we're all collaborative in an extended sense these days. Right. <laughs> we're not directly there. Um, so the grid then uh, is a practical concern, but then the instructions are the the way to respond to what's going on right now. And also just to add one other thing is that I sort of accidentally stumbled into one of the trends in contemporary photography, which is because more photographs have been made in the past 10 years than in the entire history of photography, and that's exponentially increasing, that photographers are starting to think about, well, what about all the images that have already been made? Maybe we should be dealing with those rather than just making new ones all the time. Um, and guess what? <laughs> what happened? So. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I hadn't even gone around. I, that actually leads me to one of my other questions about using, right, <laughs> um, um, uh, recycling and, and reusing uh, um, objects and uh, how limited supplies may have made that was what, 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 where I was coming from was, oh, so you don't have access to things, but you bring up a whole new issue of, of needing to, to um, manage all of this um, material that we have out there. So, um, but following up on that, um, I think Joe and Mary were two other people who sort of grabbed things from the immediate environment. Um, um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about that idea of recycling, reusing um, as, a, as a strategy. <laughs> well, uh, specifically about my piece, um, it was, you know, it's, it was interesting because I didn't seek this object out. You know, I could be in a junk store and see it mm -hmm, and I'd be mm -hmm. like, oh, that's awesome. I'm going to take it home. Um, but I, I happened by it and I just knew that I, I, I just, I was just attracted to it. Like, you know, after a while, my wife was like, oh, should we take that to the thrift store? I'm like, no, you know, but I didn't want it on in my house, let's say on a shelf or something, you know, but I, I just, there was something about it that I just, I wanted, I wanted to keep it around and wait for the opportunity that I could do something with it. And I don't know if I initially thought that it would be clay related, but um, that's what it, that's what it uh, ended up being. So. Um, and, oh. Okay, so I was just gonna say that um, I had recently rid my studio of all kinds of found objects. I was gonna do this whole new body of work. And so, as I mentioned, um, the things I was using um, were not things I intended to use. Um, but again, uh, with this time um, and just really truly um, listening to these conversations uh, with these materials and sitting there and wondering, what am I gonna do with these and um, it just really all fell together and I'm really pleased with it now. Um, you know, sometimes you just have to follow that zone and just work through it and the answer is there. And I feel like it was this time, so. Sort of inspiring us all to look around us, right? And, <laughs> and be creative. Excellent. Hey, Carol, I wanted to, um, there was a question that came up right away for Joe, and he was just talking about his work. Mm -hmm. And the question was, is the 46 whiskey cups a reference to the presidential election? Certainly. I could add 47, 48. <laughs> But not um, but, but <laughs> so it'll be an ongoing work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But when I when I um, fired a bunch of these and I I did the math, I was like, oh, I need to go find three more, or fire three more. 
Mm-hmm. And I know um, numbers, you know, um, the significance of that. I, w- I was intrigued installing Sam's work of the long, your long piece, mm-hmm. that it was 18 feet long, 18 inches tall, and there were 18 panels that comprised it. And um, just found it intriguing. Did, did you find, Sam, any significance with those numbers at all? Uh, not the number 18 in particular, but uh, more I was thinking about it in terms of the, like the body, uh, my body in particular, and thinking about um, what, I, so I wanted to make something that felt absurdly long and, um, you know, unyielding in a way, or, or maybe that's not exactly right, but something that just felt excessive. Um, and I was thinking about like, <clears throat> There, there are vertical lines, a pattern that you can see if you look closely at the painting, if you step up to it. But from a distance, it looks like a, a broad line, like a line of redaction or something. And as you approach, you start to see these other things, these vertical lines, you know, a little bit like tally marks or a little bit like a pattern. And, um, and then the hard lines of the panels separating. So the, each panel only being 12 inches wide but 18 of them. So I was thinking about things like counting things, like counting the days or counting the lives or counting um, something that felt uncertain or reoccurring. And, uh, and then the texture itself is kind of, I don't know, I think of it almost like tar-like or something like that. And um, there's a kind of tumult, I think, about the surface. And uh, so not, I wasn't thinking so much about 18 as a number, but I was thinking about like, what can I see from far away from 20 feet away, what can I see when I'm close? And I wanted uh, the experience to affect a person's body when seeing it. Like to really see the thing, you, it's hard to grasp at once. So you, at a distance, you see it in a certain way and nearby, you see it in a certain way and really you have to move. It, it affects you, it affects your physical self. And so I wanted that to be part of the experience of the artwork. Movement in a time of sitting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had one other um, sort of theme that came out from your guys' talking, which was collaboration with Andrea and, uh, and Rachel in particular. And I'm wondering if I know both of you work with collaboration and all of you often work with collaboration as part of how you um, um, do your process. But um, since the two of you brought that in today, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, is that different in a pandemic? How do you do that? Um, and I know some of that work maybe happened beforehand, but um, how would you imagine trying to do it now? Um, I can start um, and uh, say, uh, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things with uh, the pandemic is that it's really kind of changed how a lot of those conversations can take place and really changed in in some ways the nature of the work for um so the work that that I showed was actually done um pre um uh pandemic actually the the work the the show closed in St. Paul just before the the pandemic started um but as I've been working on 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 other projects um and that relate to collaboration. For example, I'm I'm directing a segment of uh, an Arab American dance um, performer's uh, solo performance. And so right now, but where we started um, back uh, in early 2020, which was meeting um, uh, meeting in person and and really sort of working through the ideas that we were trying to to uh, work on um, collaboratively in terms of this this performance um, really abruptly changed, you know, come March. Um, And so uh, uh, we moved to virtual, which was, you know, very different for something that has like a real sort of physicality. And we've, you know, we've worked, I think we've tried our, you know, to, um, you know, as much as as possible to to work through that. And we are. Um, But with that came also sort of postponements of, um, of performances. 
you know, so the performances that should have been in, were, were planned to be in September of 22 are, are now sometime hopefully in, in 21. Um, uh, one of the performances will be um, outside. Um, and so that has, has changed that. Um, but, you know, at the same time, there have, um, out of that process, and, you know, for, I have found some really kind of um, interesting things that have come out, and maybe this kind of touch, touches a little bit about what Sam was talking about, about mm -hmm. some of the areas for, for growth. Um, but one of the things in terms of, I found myself really missing that like in-person connection with the person I'm working with, with a, uh, a collaborator on this. And um, so I started finding just scraps and this relates to maybe what Mary was talking about and others, but just scraps of images that I had, um, you know, in my, um, uh, in my studio. Um, and I started cutting, some of them were already test strips, but then I started cutting them up and then putting them back together and then writing like ideas about the work and then putting them actually into, um, into the mail so that there could be some form of sort of tactile connection. And I, I found myself actually sewed a pouch. Um, but all this is to say that this led to this other piece that I'm working on right now, which is this wearable book and sort of how you know, an exhibition of work, we can carry it with us and it can be sort of like have that spontaneous performative aspect, um, but it also doesn't rely on an exhibition space. It's just, we can, we can make it and whoever's wearing it can, it become sort of an exhibition in and of itself. So there's all those really, I think, um, you know, while it really changed things up and, and I also found like a pause, like I needed to take a pause um, uh, when everything going on. But also I'll, I'll add that, you know, we're talking about the pandemic, but, you know, we're, we were also living through during this time, one of the, the biggest um, racial uprisings, yep. you know, in our, in our country and, and, and globally that um, I think really has uh, also an effect, um, or at least has affected um, you know, our understanding of, of, of things. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I was kind of went on a little bit longer than, than maybe you had, um, planned for, but, uh, and I can turn it over to, to Rachel. Thanks, Andrea. Um, briefly, uh, just to go off of what Andrea said at the end there, uh, my work was made long before the pandemic and the pandemic shut down a lot of book activity, both in terms of the haptic touchable qualities and also like publishers I was going to be looking into for my pregnancy book that I had the previous show of. Um, but uh, two really transformative things for me um, that came out of this time, I, I, and I'm sorry, I forget your exact question at this point, but, but one had to do with um, collaborating, that's right, collaborating, collaborating with my children, um, you know, that they, they were home all the time. And uh, so one thing I found myself um, doing was bringing them to, um, at first I didn't bring them anywhere, but eventually feeling safe to, to um, bring them into a space where we could print um, posters together. And, um, and then segueing off of what Andrea said, just feeling really aware of, um, more aware than ever of tying my sort of environmental interests and feminist interests to racial justice interests and environmental justice as a whole. Uh, and so I was seeking, um, you know, usually I'm collaborating with authors who are coming to campus uh, and, and making broadsides or books like you saw. Um, but right now I, I wouldn't say, I, I feel like it would be presumptuous of myself to call myself a collaborator in this case, but I'm definitely a supporter visually in, in art form of the Stop Line 3 movement in Northern Minnesota now. And that's something that um, I, I have not been before. Um, I mean, I've always, um, oppose that pipeline for um, for a lot of reasons um, having to do with environmental justice and what it's doing to indigenous lands and rights but uh, and, and what might it do to the Mississippi River but now I feel like I've found this way to like use my art um, to help um, help that movement uh, in where I'm in communication with the indigenous women who are leading the movement and trying to find out what would be useful um, and there's a whole art group that is kind of formed around that and, and collaborating with that so 
um, I'll leave it at that, but I, I think we've all found, yeah, new ways to collaborate. I've also collaborated with Andrea um, on uh, teaching <laughs> projects and a visiting artist who's, um, we, we are bringing in on Monday, the, the art department as a whole is bringing in an indigenous woman artist named Erin Genia to speak at seven o'clock on Monday night. And I wanted to be sure to mention that. I hope you'll all be able to, to join then as well. So thank you. And I'll hand it over to Jill. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I, I miss you all. I miss seeing you in the buildings and um, it's so good to have you all together and, and to hear you talk about your work. Um, Carol, thank you so much for being the facilitator of the questions and um, I thank the rest of you again for your presence. And it's, uh, it's an outstanding exhibition in how it does echo our thoughts in our times with the pandemic. Um, it puts a smile on my face to think that the next time the faculty exhibition happens, um, it's supposed to be at St. John's, that it will be in person and it will have food and um, refreshments and some cranberry fizz punch and there'll be a buzz uh, uh, going on. So um, I wanna thank uh, everyone for attending and to remind people to come out to see the actual exhibition. It is up again through May 20th and the hours are Monday, excuse me, Tuesday through Friday, 11 to 4.30. And um, I also would like to mention that the next and last exhibition of the season will be the senior art thesis exhibition at St. John's. It's titled SOAR and it will feature 11 seniors and doing work, sharing with us uh, work in paper and clay sculpture, ceramics, book arts, video, graphite drawings, digital prints, and uh, their student teaching portfolios. So that will open April 9th and they will have um, they will ha also have an artist talk that will be done in the same format as this one that will be Saturday, April 10th at uh, 1 p.m. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that as well. Uh, again, as an extension of Carol's uh, celebration with the faculty, um, please also tune in um, for the Chinese, uh, the presentation virtual talk on the Chinese gardens. Monday, May 10th at five. And if you need any more information um, to please go to our art department and find arts programming websites. So thank you again. Um, I wanna just lastly say how much I feel that teaching is the noblest of all professions and uh, what you have done, um, an um, unbelievable job with uh, not only um, adapting your curriculum, um, but also supporting our students in multiple ways uh, while working through your own art. So thank you, stay well everyone, and uh, good night. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Jill, couldn't do it without you. <laughs> thank you, Carol.